Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crilly. I'm back with another video. Today we're going to be learning about comic book storytelling, and I think really one of the best ways to understand it is by seeing entire sequences uh, of pages that tell uh, an entire small part of the story. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to present to you three different sequences from my Brody's Ghost and Mickey Falls series, and then after I've just shown them to you, I'll go back and explain the various decisions that I made that sort of uh, brought them into being. So let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get into the first one. Grandma, look at that man over there. What's wrong with him? Hush, darling. It's not polite to stare at troubled people. It can't be you. It just can't be. I mean, come on. I wasn't expecting a movie star or anything, but look at you. You're so scuzzy. All right, so what's your name then? Okay, clearly you're not ready for this yet. Look, I'm going to go away for a while and give you a chance to calm down. But when I come back, we're going to have a conversation. That means I say something, and then you say something. Preferably without looking like you just took a dump in your pants. And please, for the love of God, get a haircut, will you? All right, well, now that we've gone through the whole scene, let's go back and I'll show you how I put it together. It begins with this big double page spread. Of course, you want to be very careful about um, what moments deserve a big double page spread like this. And of course, in a story called Brody's Ghost, when Brody meets the ghost, that is a pivotal moment and uh, it is deserving, I think, of a double page spread. That's why I uh, devoted that, uh, this much space to it. Um, you want to take into account where the gutter is, the sort of space in here, and so I planned it out so that the faces would not get caught in that uh, part of the book. Um, otherwise, it's mainly just giving you a big cinematic feeling of what it would be like if you were Brody uh, to um, be confronted by this ghost in broad daylight out on the, you know, out on the street. Now, we uh, come over here, and after a brief moment of them being face-to-face, -face, we pull away abruptly and see this little boy saying, Hey, Grandma, look at that man over there. What's wrong with him? Well, What's the point of this? The whole point of this is to explain to the reader, basically, Brody is the only one who sees the ghost. Other people are unable to see uh, Talia, and um, it's much more interesting to, to have a little uh, scene here. We call it, you know, show, don't tell, rather than putting a narration box that says, I was the only one able to see her. Um, that's spoon-feeding information to the reader. You don't want to do that. You want to show them by way, uh, I decided, of a little kid. Uh, you know, talking to his grandma and saying, hey, what's wrong with that crazy man over there, <laughs> basically, is what it ends up being. Um, and that gracefully puts across to the reader a pretty crucial um, uh, point of information about how not anyone can see this ghost, only uh, Brody. Anyway, so now we begin the conversation, and it's a sort of a challenging sequence because I decided, for realism's sake, that Brody would not say a single word during this scene. And um, why did I make that decision? I just sort of asked myself, how would I react? <laughs> how would any of us react if we actually saw a ghost in real life? And that was the challenge for me. And I thought, you wouldn't be able to suddenly start talking to the ghost, right? You wouldn't be like, who are you? Why are you coming to me? You know, that just seemed highly unrealistic to me. I thought you would be shocked into silence if this happened to you. And that's why Brody doesn't say a single thing during the scene. And there's a contrast between his, you know, being completely shocked and his life kind of changing in a single moment to her casualness. And I wanted to have her always very casual and kind of, um, you know, like this is not a big deal to her. And of course, that's part of her personality and part of the scene is putting across Talia's uh, personality. You notice that we get into a bit of a trap of face, 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 and all the panels are just showing uh, faces, and that's why when we get over here, I pull up and do a sort of a crane shot to, um, you know, give us a little break from seeing the faces all the time, and, uh, and just to sort of add some visual interest 
to uh, the to the sequence of panels. And so you may find yourself in a situation, especially in dialogue scenes, where you have just shown paid panel after panel of faces, and you might want to consider coming up with some other angle, some other point of view, just to make things more interesting. And of course, here we sort of lead up to Talia's um, exit. And this is may maybe more about writing than it is about drawing, but you do want to end with some little bit of a zinger, you know, you don't want to just have her say, okay, well, I'm going to go away and I'll see you later, dude, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And so I came up with this idea of her saying, please, for the love of God, get a haircut, will you? Um, and that, uh, that is a joke. It becomes an on sort of ongoing gag that comes back later uh, in the story. Um, but, um, you know, when you're crafting a scene like this, you want to make sure that you, you lead up to some sort of final line of dialogue and maybe some final image that just feels like you've reached the end. You don't want to just drop off the sequence in the middle of, um, of a kind of a nothing moment. So, uh, also this maybe conveys this idea that Talia is capable of vanishing at any point, and many of the dialogue scenes between Brody and Talia will end this way, uh, showing her gradually uh, disappearing. Anyway, that's pretty much that scene. Let's move on to another one and see what we can learn from that one. After a quick breakfast at the station, we took a local train to a small town further inland, where we boarded a bus bound for an even smaller town, then rode a taxi to a mountain village so incredibly small its only traffic signal was a stop sign. From there we continued on foot. Asphalt turned to gravel and gravel to dirt before finally we came to the end of our journey. Hiro, I don't think anyone lives here anymore. That's a definite possibility. Then, just as I was wondering where the nearest youth hostel was, chuck, chuck, chuck. What was that? I don't know, but I think it came from behind the house. Whack! The trail's that way, down the hill, other side of the creek. The trail? Yes, you're hikers, right? You must have strayed from the trail. It's happened before, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, we're not, uh, hikers. Not hikers? Then why on earth did you come all the way up? Hiro. Hiro Sakurai. I'm so sorry, Yamada-san, for barging in like this, uh, for not warning you. Good heavens, it is you. You've grown so much since that day we met, I almost didn't recognize you. Please forgive me. Bah, enough apologies. Come inside my house and stay as long as you like. Why, you can even stay the night if you like. And I'll stop the sequence there, um, but uh, this is in a way another sort of introductory scene where we meet a character for the first time, though it's quite different, of course, uh, from the Talia one. Um, this is sort of an interesting page, another double page spread as it happens, though it sort of performs different uh, duties in the story. This one is more of like a montage scene, like you might see in a, in a film where you blend from one uh, quick little... Um, scene to another to sort of suggest the passage of time, and uh, I'm, I'm basically sort of gearing up for the appearance of this house that they arrive at, and showing how remote it is as we get to this new part of the story where they're way off somewhere um, in the mountains, and uh, so I enjoyed, um, again, taking advantage of the horizontal space to create this a uh, big image of the path that they're traveling up, uh, but then also making use of this upper left-hand corner for these three little um, slightly washed-out scenes that that um, build drama, I think, maybe not so much drama, but build anticipation as to, you know, where are they going to end up being, having gone uh, such uh, a great distance out into the middle of nowhere. 
Um, and then I really enjoy this sort of uh, sequence of pages here. We begin with uh, their facial reaction to what they see. Uh, we see this rundown house, um, you know, pretty straightforward, their point of view. And I'll do this a lot in my storytelling. We see the reaction, we see what they see. Uh, the two basic things that we need to understand. And then I, I enjoyed what I was able to do here by pulling into the interior of the house. You really do sort of feel like a Hollywood movie director uh, deciding where the camera goes, but looking back at them, and I don't know if you're able to see, but they're, this is our two characters way off in the distance. I get my sound effect word here. And uh, doing my best to suggest um, that there is nobody in this house anymore. And I think putting these two birds here is pretty key to uh, giving us, um, I don't know, the impression that this is an abandoned house. Of course, you know already that that is not the case, but at this stage we want, to, we want the reader to be kind of lured into that assumption. Uh, and we spend a few panels um, having showing that... Uh, you know, Miki and Hiro are also uh, doubting that anyone could possibly still be living in this house. Um, and then we uh, we start with the sound effect of the chut chut chut, uh, which we will soon come to realize is um, uh, is an axe. And um, uh, I kind of like that the, that there are quite a number of sort of visual uh, storytelling moments in this scene in which I don't explain too much. I just let you as the uh, reader kind of accompany Hiro and Miki around to the back of the house and see what they see without a whole lot of um, narrative explanation. Um, this is kind of a classic thing, I think, where we, we take an elderly character and show that they are maybe different from what we might expect an elderly person to be. We show how good she is with an axe cutting the wood uh, with a single blow, you know, of the uh, axe and kind of uh, shocking uh, or impressing uh, Miki and Hiro with her brute strength. And then uh, she's sort of whistling as she picks up the wood. And uh, we're cutting back and forth, showing different uh, things to sort of establish where they are into re in relation to one another. And then um, we move over here, and I pull out a sort of a Japanese manga technique of showing a character head to toe. Uh, this is our first good look at uh, this character, Yamada. Uh, the woman who lives up in the mountains, and so we want to know what she looks like, and it becomes a more interesting layout uh, if she's not, she doesn't have any panel that's boxing her in. She's just sort of popped out, and uh, it makes the page more interesting. Um, we get to see a transition between her initial look of surprise to her sort of softening, uh, smiley, happy facial expression. And I sort of like the idea of not really explaining why she suddenly starts talking about the trail. Hey, the trail is that way, down the hill, other side of the creek. And sometimes it's good for the reader to temporarily be like, huh? What? Why is she talking about a trail? And then we never do fully explain it. We allow the reader to sort of come to understand, oh, you're hikers. Oh, she's thinking that the only reason these two kids have come along is because of a trail. And uh, again, this sort of principle of showing, not telling. Don't explain any more than you really need to. Allow the reader to sort of figure it out. Um, and I can't get too much into the backstory here, but this sort of there's a humorous moment here where Miki is kind of giving Hiro the eye because she was told that this wo old woman should immediately recognize Hiro, and the fact that she doesn't um, causes um, <laughs> Hiro a, a certain amount of embarrassment. Of course, he is right that she does eventually recognize him, and I like this sort of sequence of panels here as we, uh, we're sort of at a mid-shot of her face, and then we pull in real close at the precise moment that she recognizes him. I think that's a nice little trick of, of you know, dialing up the drama just a little bit uh, as we reach that moment. And then, uh, yeah, it's just sort of fun to, uh, again, pull the camera around to different points of view, deciding when to use a close-up, when to pull back. Um, and uh, I have talked about this in other videos, about my technique of uh, lining up the dialogue so that we always know exactly what word balloons to read in what order. Um, I call it text snaking. <laughs> Don't know if that <laughs> will ever catch on, but it is a nice way of avoiding any um, ambiguity as to what uh, to read from one panel to the next. Anyway, that sort of gives you the basics of uh, that sequence, and let's move on to our third and final sequence.
Um, before we get into this, I just want to say that, you know, I don't consider any of the scenes in this video to be true spoilers. They're not giving away anything major. Um, but those of you who are, like, really serious about spoilers may consider this third scene something that you want to save until you've actually read the Brody's Ghost series. Uh, in which case, you might want to just hit the stop button right now and not watch anymore. But honestly, it's not really giving away much of anything. Um, so, let's go ahead and get into it. Who are you talking to? I, uh, who is it, Landon? It's nothing, babe. Just sit tight. I'll be right back. It's Brody, right? Hey, man, I, I know this looks bad, but yes, Brody, it looks bad. Because it is bad. You are stalking your ex-girlfriend outside the home of her new boyfriend. That is bad in ways you don't seem to understand. It's not stalking. Then what is it? No, wait, don't answer that. I don't even want to know. Look, Brody, I'm a reasonable man. And it's not my style to threaten a guy who clearly has... issues. But I have just one responsibility here. And that's to protect Nicole. Absolutely. Protecting her is what this is all about. Especially at night. On a rainy night, say. In the city. That's when you'll need to be extra vigilant. Nicole is in a very, very dangerous situation right now. Brody, just what exactly are you trying to say to me? Look, Landon, I know you look at me and all you can see is some weird dude who used to date Nicole. But I need you to just set that aside and trust me when I tell you that I know, in a very factual way, that there is someone who is in danger of causing Nicole serious bodily harm. Now you listen to me. You will never, ever get anywhere near Nicole again. Do you understand me? Not me. I'm talking about you need help, Brody. You are hearing voices. You are talking to people who aren't there. What's going on up there? Almost done, babe. I'll stop following her. And I'll get myself some help. You know, a, a psychiatrist or something. You're not the only one who can stalk people, Brody. And the scene continues, but I think I'll just stop it right there. That kind of gives you um, a good chunk of it. And uh, let's go back and talk about some of uh, these decisions. Of course, I've devoted quite a big frame to this introduction uh, of the character Landon, uh, making, uh, making it very clear where they are in relationship to one another. Um, and then uh, moving on over to here, we, we sort of introduced the idea of uh, this third character, Nicole, who we never actually see, but uh, on the other side of the fence, who periodically uh, shouts up. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Landon re replying to her, constantly calling her Babe, <laughs> which for some reason I think so tells us something about Landon's character I don't know why but uh, anyway uh, you'll see me doing a lot of sort of shifting of point of view here this aerial scene here um, uh, as I said before kind of spicing things up in terms of not just having face after face but also this is uh, I feel when you pull far away and you have a blank panel in which nobody says anything you kind of transmit to the reader this idea of this was a long pause uh, this is maybe the equivalent of three or four blank panels of nobody saying anything. Um, that's just my theory, that when you give great distance to the characters, the pause somehow feels longer. Um, this is very important to me, having uh, panels where people interrupt each other. Let me see if I can zoom in here just a little bit. Um, I have a pet peeve about... Uh, panels, uh, or not panels, but word balloons, where people are interrupting one another, uh, being too far away from each other on the page. When I have a character interrupt another character, I always get that thing right on top, so that um, they are in such close uh, proximity to each other that the reader can kind of hear the one character cutting off the other. Hey man, I know this looks bad, but yes, Brody, it looks bad. Um, and if those two word balloons, like if, if his word balloon is over here, and then this one is over here, uh, just that millisecond as you move from one to the other, to me, sort of prevents the sensation of the real, um, you know, cutting off, interrupting uh, feeling. I do this a lot where I will have no panel, 
and zoom in real close and have the white of the page behind this guy's face, a little bit in silhouette. Uh, I think it gives a, a nice sort of 3D effect uh, to the page, but this is very much just one of my own uh, preferences. You can see me using bold type. This is nothing new to emphasize the highly stressed words that are supposed to sound a little louder in the mind of the reader. Um, and uh, this is an interesting one where he interrupts himself. This is maybe the first time I've ever done this in a story. I found myself wanting him to ask a question and then not allow Brody to answer it. Then what is it? No, wait, don't answer that. And so in, in a funny way, he's interrupting himself. Uh, another blank panel. These little blank pause panels, I think, are very important in storytelling. Consider using them in dialogue scenes um, to, con to convey those little breaks, those little beats between... Um, exchanges. I liked uh, this sequence where he says, you know, it's not my style to threaten a guy who clearly has dot 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 issues. And between those two word balloons we zoom in, we get the finger up to the temple, and it becomes very clear, um, you know, what Landon is insinuating here. And this is all based on the fact, as we introduced way long ago, that uh, sometimes Brody appears to be talking to no one, uh, which of course causes us all to assume that he's crazy, which uh, to me I think is an interesting sort of predicament to put your main character into, um, constantly having to worry that someone's going to see him talking to what appears to be no one. Um, and of course he does in a way behave kind of like a crazy man as he leaps immediately to all this talk about uh, Nicole being in a dangerous situation and so forth. And I enjoyed setting up this situation where, you know, Brody thinks that he's uh, maybe bringing Landon over to his side and, and getting him to see things the way he does, when of course he's just making things worse and having Landon believe that, that Brody is a crazy person who is going to cause uh, Nicole serious bodily harm. And uh, we get the big, uh, you know, and, and it, I, I planned it out so that it would happen at the page turn. We don't really know at this stage how Landon is going to react. He looks a little surprised, but we, we're not sure until we turn the page and suddenly it becomes very uh, violent and, and um, hopefully a little bit of a shock there, how far Landon decides to escalate things at this moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, uh, cutting back and forth. I mean, uh, I remember planning out this page and sh trying to set it up so that we had the feeling of moving literally from one panel to the other, even though there's kind of two different, slightly different points of view here. Uh, getting this um, speed line that zooms us right from one panel to the other, had to work at that out in advance to figure out how do I convey this feeling of getting, of Brody getting slammed into the fence in a visual way that makes sense to the reader. Um, and uh, otherwise, yeah, you know, sort of a periodically cutting to an aerial shot to, to make things more interesting. Um, but I do tend to, you know, for dramatic moments of uh, emotional intensity to, to zoom in quite often on the face. Um, maybe, as I have said before, more often than I even should. Here's another panel of just, um, nothing, seemingly nothing going on, but I do think, again, pulling way far back conveys a sense of time elapsing uh, before Brody um, speaks. And uh, you can see continually I'm getting in little blank reaction shots. These things seem very important to me, uh, just for pacing and for understanding what's going on in the mind uh, of each individual character. And, uh, yeah. That's maybe all I need to say about that. You may consider, again, like I do, periodically getting rid of the panel and creating some sort of, uh, you know, borderless panel that falls behind uh, all the rest of the panels on the page. That's mainly for me just to make things a little more interesting in terms of the layout. Although, again, it may, in this case, um, give us this added sense of distance and, and create an extra pause there uh, before the final... Uh, well, final in the way I read the sequence to you, <laughs> line of uh, of Landon somewhat menacingly introducing the idea that uh, he uh, can stalk people just the same way that Brody does. Uh, anyway, uh, that kind of takes you through the third uh, and final scene there. I hope you found this uh, useful. These I consider these little extra uh, videos that I do about comic book storytelling to be um, mainly for the people who are 
uh, either serious about trying to do it themselves, uh, for which I dare say uh, this kind of video is uh, should be highly useful, and then also for those who just want to appreciate the nuts and bolts behind, um, you know, the creative process of of creating comics maybe helps you to have an added level of appreciation for just, uh, you know, how much thought and consideration goes into every little step in a sequence. Anyway, let's go ahead and wind this one down. I really do hope you enjoyed it. I certainly had fun uh, making the video, and I'll be back with another one real soon.